think everybody's back in the room. I'm going to throw the talking ball over to Corey to get us started. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yep. Well, thank you for joining. I know things were a bit different. Um, if you've been on one of our um, community meetups, I normally start, but I thought it was actually quite an exciting thing for, for Judy to, to break everyone off into uh, meetup rooms and kind of recreate that in the room feeling of walking straight in and, and meeting people and talking to a complete stranger who you've never met, um, just to see how, how things are going. How, how is life treating you in this new normal of a world that we're, we're living in at the moment? So. Um, welcome to today's community meetup. My name is Corey Sutherland and I am the marketing manager for um, Adventures with Agile. Um, and as you know, this meetup is Escape Worn Out Meetings in Three Simple Steps. And it is hosted by the incredible Judy Reese, who you've heard talking <laughs> and, and putting you into to many rooms <laughs> today. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with Adventures with Agile, we are a global agile training provider and our ethos is all about wor uh, making working life better. Um, and it's great to see some familiar faces as always. So welcome back. And if you are new and this is your first time um, attending one of our meetups, I, on behalf of the AWA team, would like to extend a big warm welcome. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we host meetups every month. So you can visit our website, uh, adventureswithagile.com, or you can head over to our meetup page to see all our um, upcoming meetups um, that you can join. And our meetups are all free so you can take advantage of them. Also, if you have social media, please give us a follow on all our social media platforms. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and we're on YouTube as well. So it's a great opportunity for you to, to catch up and stay connected with everything that we're doing. Um, and just a reminder, our sessions are recorded. Um, so you can find videos of our previous meetups on our website and social media channels as well. So any ones that you've missed, head on over to our website and YouTube channel. I and mean, you can find all of them there. So enough of me talking. I'm going to hand back over to, um, to Judy, who's going to give us this very different webinar, as we was expecting. It's not a webinar. <laughs> it's not a webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, so again, thank you all for joining. I hope you learn something and take something away from today's meetup. Um, and Judy, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Everybody, it's lovely to be here. Um, so the notion of this event is that it is definitely not going to be a webinar. The idea is we're looking at uh, um, escaping worn out um, uh, webinar formats in three simple moves. And the idea therefore is that it won't be so much me talking, you guys will be doing stuff just as we would in the room. Some of you will remember AWA events in various offices in London. I've attended lots of those and met some fantastic people. So I'm pretty confident there's loads of brilliant people on this call and I want you to meet each other. So there are going to be lots of opportunities to do that. There is of course going to be some of me talking, but I'm, the idea is to squeeze my information in between the connecty bits where you guys get to talk to each other. This will work best if you're willing to go into a breakout room to talk to other people, ideally with your camera on. Um, and I appreciate that some people are in positions where they either can't join the breakout room or they have a difficulty putting their camera on. If you can't join the breakout room, it's okay. And if at any point I call on you to speak and you just can't because stuff's going on behind you or whatever, uh, if you can say pass or just wave or something, we'll move on to someone else. That's the rule. It's all OK to pass. Nothing is compulsory. Everything's voluntary. But my experience has been over not just the last year, but many, many years of working in virtual events, that when you engage, you'll get a lot more out of it. You get out of things what you put into them. So your engagement will help to support other people's engagement. Anything else anyone needs to know about how the next um, hour and a bit are going to go? Okay, let's press on. Two things I want to quickly share in the chat. One is um, the slide deck I'll be using. I've put it on Google Slides, so if anyone wants to follow along with that on a separate screen, 
um, you're very welcome to. The second link I've put in the chat just there is some of you will be wondering, how is she showing her slides behind her like that? The answer is in the blog post that I've just shared in the chat, so you can look that up later. Okay, let's dive into the next bit. Um, this whole thing about uh, three simple moves, I suppose a bit of conceit. The idea, the idea is that you can reach higher with impactful event design, step back to win yourself and your participants more time in your calendars, and then jump ahead um, by taking the easy way to fun, lively, and attractive online gatherings. So that's where we're going today. Um, let me do a first bit of talky bit, which is around the first of those three simple moves. Impactful event design. When I'm talking about events, it includes quite a lot of the kinds of meetings that you guys will be organizing routinely. Event in this category is any kind of online synchronous all at the same time gathering where we've got more than about half a dozen people and up to about 300 ish. So what I'm going to be talking about here will apply to your monthly departmental meeting. It'll in apply to all sorts of town hall type events. It'll in apply to big room planning. We've applied it to things like um, stakeholder gatherings, board meetings, um, gatherings of donors for charities. And organizations also for setting up communities of practice and that kind of thing. And of course, to meetups of all kinds. So if you're involved in organizing any of those kind of events or um, meetings or gatherings, this applies to you. Oh, I've just realized that um, I think that everybody here will be seeing me small together with everybody else. So we're all the same size. If you're currently seeing me big and you want to see everybody, there's a button at the top right which says view and you can toggle between gallery view and uh, speaker view. I haven't asked Corrie to spotlight me so that you're in control. You get to decide whether you want to see the group or you get to see, um, see me big. It's up to you. I hope you don't want to see me big because I haven't got any makeup on. <laughs> Um, so hopefully you get to choose. There's all sorts of advantages in that, and we might get into that. So event about what the events are in my mind. Also event design. A lot of people don't seem to realize that events can be designed. There are lots and lots of different ways of doing it. What we found though, is that event design absolutely makes a huge difference to people's attention. We've occasionally been called on to, when I say we, Reese McCann is the name of my company, that's me and Steve McCann and our associates. We've occasionally been called on to try and rescue events that have been basically designed as, um, as webinars. 45 minutes of talking and then quarter of an hour of either frantic questions or tumbleweed as the host def desperately goes, has, has nobody got any questions then? It's really difficult to rescue an event that's been designed like that. Desi uh, participation, engagement, attention needs to be designed in ahead of time. When you do that, you get all the advantages of in the room meetups without the disadvantages. You get to save the money, so you don't need to hire the venue, you don't need to pay the, the travel costs. You also get to build the relationships. So let's use Adventures with Agile as an example. When they did their regular in-the-room meetups in London, they did it to build relationships because people knew them. People knew the organisers, they knew all the people who were involved in Adventures with Agile, they'd met them, they'd said hello to them. So when they wanted one of the services that Adventures with Agile supplied, oh, they were top of mind. 
and they were likely to spend their money with Adventures with Agile. Now, in the online environment, we need to keep on building those relationships, whether it's with potential customers, potential employers, potential colleagues, um, potential donors for, for charities and so forth. All those relationships need to keep on going in order for the, the money making to keep on happening. So that's part of, of why you should design well. Great online events can also reduce risk. They're actually safer than in the room events. There's actually far fewer things that can go wrong in this environment. And not to forget saving the planet. If we can create online events that really work and reduce the travel, we're, we're doing good stuff. And one of the interesting things about online event design is that some of the really simple formulas can be repeated over and over again because they work by using the resources in the room. They use the people who turn up to add the interest, to add the excitement. That means you can use the same designs repeatedly. Okay, I'm, before I say, has anyone got any comments or questions about that? I'm going to invite to join some breakout rooms to chat about what I just talked about and how might all of that be relevant to your work? And when you come back, we'll, we'll hear from some of the groups, not from all of the groups, some of the things you've talked about. So how might more engaging online events be useful to you in your work? You're going to be in groups of mostly three. If you should find yourself on your own, don't panic, just sit tight and I'll move you to a group with other people. You're going to have a total of four minutes plus a 30 second countdown timer. That should give you enough time to chat to each other. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Opening the rooms now. Welcome back everybody and welcome to the couple of people who've just joined because they were they were having to finish off uh, various meetings and retros and, and have arrived a little late. So to catch them up, what, what happened in your couple of things that people have been talking about that are worthy of sharing? Oh, hello Carlo, how are you doing? Um, Hi there. <laughs> Um, so what, what were you talking about? Uh, challenges in, I think, in, in the group that we were in, we were talking about um, the different uh, ways people can approach online meetings and the fact that you may set different expectations if you're um, in, in a virtual format um, and also challenges around, in, in my particular challenge is that when I'm at work, um, due to the very restricted nature and the place I work at, um, I have no access to cameras or rooms and I have a very old client. Um, and it, and that's a web client rather than client. The client themselves is very, very old. But um, it, it gives, it, we can't do the more engage, it, it, making an engaging online event is really difficult when you can't do this. But also in the room that we spoke about was just people talking about um, how you may not be at your desk. You may be, if you're working from home, you may be, may be in different places and therefore it can be somewhat of a challenge for people to put their cameras on when they know that they're kind of not sitting in a formal um, position, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, there are all sorts of challenges. Um, are they worth overcoming? How would more engaging events be useful in your work? Who's got something that would be useful about online engaging events? I'm guessing somebody has, because you've all turned up. Tony, go ahead. Um, it shall, uh, I'm quite convinced it, it shall definitely increase uh, collaboration uh, interaction uh, to get all other ones' um, opinions, also from the introverts, uh, just to, yeah, to balance uh, the, the airtime, the, the amount of speech, and that not uh, the one who is always selling something is uh, the person who is right. Mm, absolutely. Engagement. Uh, yeah, on our group we touched on uh, hi, we touched on uh, on trust and for psychological safety. You know, building those relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, in, it's more, even more difficult in a big meeting, but you know, that is something that, that pays dividends. 
absolutely. It, it makes a big difference when you can build psychological safety. There's lots of right, you, you guys have read the stuff about psychological and seen the videos about psychological safety. Building it within, within a small team is important. Building it across the piece is important too. Online engaging events help to build that safety. Is there one more person who wants to speak before we move on? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, I'm not sure if you can hear me, can you all hear yes, me? Can hear you. Right, one of the things that we need to think about with regards to psychological safety and also um, having online meetings is that one has to be very, very flexible because um, when you're online, you literally enter somebody else's house. So you need to be flexible. It doesn't matter where they are and, and which part but they are, whether they are sitting properly, whether they, they are engaged into something else, but actually participating in the meeting, you need to be flexible. Absolutely. So one has to feel that safe that, you know, they're not going to be judged based on, you know, where they are sitting or position they are found at. You understand? So I think that's really a good thing. Yeah, well, well said. Um, we've done a lot of work over the last year with people um, in a, a huge range of different countries, but including, for example, a couple of organisations based in South Africa, where you can't even guarantee a continuous flow of electricity. Their infrastructure isn't there. Um, so you have to manage, you have to improvise and find ways to overcome all sorts of practical difficulties and basic well things like embarrassment about where someone is those kind of things just need to be dealt with and we need to be flexible but it's worth it because it means we can have conversations with people all over the world and involve a huge diversity of people far wider than we ever could when everything had to be done in the room together it's all been, yeah I, I i i'm on my hobby horse again i just absolutely love this work so um yeah, so there's some good stuff. And of course, there are challenges. Let's keep acknowledging the challenges as we go through. I'm going to move on, if it's okay to you, with you, to the next one of our three simple moves, which is to step back and win yourself and your participants extra time in your calendars. This is one I love to talk about. I was doing some training for Adventures with Agile this last week, and this has turned out to be the bit that has made the most difference for the group I've been working with. Because it, it, it was a, we did two half days of training. Don't do whole days of training online. It's too tiring. Two half days, more or less get away with it. So I had had these, this group for a half day a couple of weeks ago, and then again this last week. And the thing that had made the most difference was my suggestion that you start your meeting at five minutes past the hour. One of the guys did this and he said it was really, really interesting. Not only were people pathetically grateful to get that five minutes back, to go to the loo or to get a glass of water, but he noticed, and he did it several times with 30 minute sync meetings. They were all 30 minute syncs. So he had a, a number of experiments. The thing that stuck, stuck out for him was that at, there were no longer as many, oh, just one more thing. People somehow, because they felt respected by that five minutes of soft time at the beginning, kept to time, kept to the agenda and allowed the work to get done in the time the 25 minutes so they got more done in 25 minutes than they would have done in 30. So that I think was quite interesting. Um, so that's really about when people join you in your real-time meeting, make it matter, make the time work for them and that means using high participation formats like lean coffee which a lot of you will be familiar with all the various agile ceremonies that, you, that are designed to engage people and get people involved. One of the people who arrived later has been busy doing a retro this afternoon. Of course, retro formats need to be highly engaging or you won't get people involved. Um, but one of the things you can do with online meetings more easily than you can with in the room meetings is to really use the time shifting tools 
to do our work asynchronously, not all at the same time. So whether you're using Slack or Microsoft Teams or all those kinds of tools that enable you to work collaboratively, but not all at the same time, really make use of those tools. When we're teaching remote management, which we also do, um, one of the key things is to look at the kind of meetings that people are calling and go, hang on a moment, does Ooh. that meeting need to be a meeting? An awful lot of the meetings people are having could just as easily be an email or the boss could record a video or somebody could just write something in the chat and get a quick response. Um, one of our colleagues is running a campaign he calls No Stand-Ups. He, he, he wants to end the online stand-up because he thinks that stand-ups could be better done on, uh, in, in um, email, in chat, in collaborative tools. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but you can certainly do a lot in um, asynchronous collaboration that people might not think so. And the other piece about using those tools, and those tools might, in a meetup like this or a larger event, also include social media, LinkedIn, all those kind of things. The other piece about all of that, use those to stay connected after your synchronous event, your gathering. And that means you can amplify your message by keeping connected to people. So it's so simple to send an email afterwards and say, these were the main points and here is the slides and so on and so forth. Using those tools will make a difference. I've finished talking because I don't want to do too long talky bits. Um, in a moment, I'm going to once again, send you out into breakout rooms to talk about what you've just heard. But before I do, is there anything that anyone wants to say about what you've just heard? Any comments or questions? I think just one from, from myself, it's Amanda. Um, we started doing the five minutes later, starting and five minutes early if it was an hour meeting, and that really worked well. Interesting, what kind of worked well? What, what difference did it make? I think because we have, it's literally some days can be, it's like death by a meeting. It's just meeting after meeting after meeting and you just get meetinged out, even though we have set objectives of what we want to achieve in those meetings. But you don't get time, as you said, to have a comfort break, grab a cup of coffee. And it just made, you can just clear your head between the meetings. So that really did work well. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone we've else? Implemented, yep. We've implemented... Um, a couple days of Slack standups um, instead of in person, and then um, also blocked off Thursday afternoon and all day Friday um, on my team's calendars. Just came up with a block to work so that they don't have anything um, scheduled on those days and can just work. Yeah, so no, no meeting Fridays. Nice idea that's catching on. Yep, they appreciate it. Anyone else want to comment before we? Do another breaking into breakout now, rooms thing. I also have a timeout during the day for about 20 minutes in the day that my, my team members don't really respond to anything at all. You know, they can't be reached for anything. They just have to get on with what they, they want to do for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And oh, that what, seems to work. Where did, where did that come from? I, um, I learned that from one of um, the meetups that I attended and it works for me. So. Mm -hmm. so so you just implemented it with your teams? With my teams and it works, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. The other, the other thing oh. I, I do, I, I, I default everything to a 30 minute meeting and I force um, anyone that wants to extend it on the first cycle of a meeting to then shift into justifying it agenda wise. You know, like, how are we going to block out that time? Or are we just going to sit on and have a thought stream or all the stuff we don't do it in, for a year and then come back and just keep doing that? <laughs> what most people do. <laughs> I love a 45 minute meeting. 
I was about to say any, the same thing. Any hour meeting should be 45 minutes and it forces people through the meeting to be quick, concise and focused. And then they get 15 minutes at the end to grab a cup of tea. Lovely. And Bianca, what difference does 45 minutes make for you? I just feel that nobody will set up a meeting at 1245. So this means people will always gain 15 minutes. So you sit 45 minutes in a meeting and then you definitely have a 15 minutes break. So it works. <laughs> Excellent. Now I'm thinking of doing something a little bit experimental at this point. Um, some of you will be familiar with what I'm about to do. Some of you won't. Um, it's called one, two, four, all. And the idea is that you uh, think about the question I'm about to ask you for a few um, seconds privately, reflect on your own thoughts. Um, then I'll put you into pairs to think about and talk about together your answers to the question. And then after a couple of minutes, I will combine the twos into fours. Um, hold on to your headsets at that point. It might feel a bit discombobulating, um, but uh, you'll be safe. It's only, it's only the internet, you'll be fine. And then after you've a few minutes of talking in a four, I'll call you back. So let's see if this works. It may be in this case that you find yourself on your own for a couple of minutes. If you do, please sit tight and then you will be combined into a, a, a larger group. So the question is, how do you know when you need a meeting? Take a moment to think, how do you know when you actually need to have an online meeting? Okay, having thought about that on your own, you're going to be in a pair to talk about how, how do you know when you need a meeting? I'm going to open the rooms now. Let's hear from a few of the groups. What, how do you know when you need an, when you actually need a meeting? What are some of the things you came up with? Oslem, what did what did your group talk about? Well, um, personally, I'm I am someone who uh, sees meetings as the last resort. Really, I, I have always been that way in my whole uh, working life. Uh, but I was a victim of uh, working uh, with a manager who did. Uh, all he did was basically calling meetings and talking in that in those meetings. <laughs> this lockdown was particularly uh, bad because the last 12 months of my life, I think 80% of it is <laughs> spent in those funky, meaningless meetings. Uh, we were talking about these kind of people calling those meetings, inviting everybody that they can think of and then just talking endlessly without having any conclusion or any actions or not anything like that. And we were put, we put it down to a uh, number of factors, really culture and also some managers wanting to feel useful or maybe to feel their um, role in the hierarchy or posi their position in the hierarchy. And it's a difficult thing to change. Um, it requires significant culture shift, really. Mm. Absolutely. And tact, of course, to tell. And nobody's interested. <laughs> John Lappin, what, what was happening in your group? Um, I was in the same group as I was oh, in. Uh, so it was really focusing on. Um, you know, we spoke about why is potentially why is there so many meetings? If there isn't an organisation that has a number of meetings, why? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're still in the culture, certainly a lot of the, some of the organisations I work in, certainly initially, where you see people just blocking out their calendars with meetings back to back to look busy. Mm -hmm. Again, but that can be a cultural element. That can be um, an element of strong hierarchy, mm -hmm. where you have strong positioning of certain leaders, where they you know, where 
if you don't have back-to-back -back meetings, then for some reason people perceive that, that you're not busy. And, you know, there's a, a, an incline that people need to block out their calendars, you know, mm. because it's going reverting back to type, reverting back to tra traditional methods. Um, but also I would question why so many meetings? You know, that's one thing that I do as an agile coach and go, well, why we're having these meetings? You know, mm. I'm all for collaboration. That could be one on one or a small group. Uh, it's definitely for the last year where we're in the position where we have to take things um, to a virtual mm. um, virtual element. So therefore, we have to have these conversations. So I focus on more about having conversations and less meetings. Yeah, nice. um, and because the collaboration side and, and, and communication is, is so important to any level of agility so that was just leading on from, from what was previously said that was one another element that we discussed um so i think i think one other thing that was, was just important was the fact that you know we need to focus in on the right having the right attendees and participants within the meeting we, we don't want to you know it's about getting mm -hmm. value and getting maybe potential outcomes or conclusions and therefore having the right people and keeping them as short and synced, and, and succinct as they need to be. Um, and if it only takes five minutes, then great. If it takes one minute, even better. If it takes half an hour, then so be it. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, a couple of people have found the raise hand button. So let's hear first from Sue Coyne and then from Aaron. Hi, Judy. Um, yeah, I'm a leadership coach. And one of the things that we challenge leadership teams to think about, because often it's information sharing that they call these meetings for, is what percentage of the time in their meeting is generative dialogue, that mm -hmm. they come up with things that they couldn't have come up with separately. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but some, so it's generative. And then from the discussions that I had here today, we came down to, well, actually it's, it's, it's relationship building, it's morale boosting, it's connectivity really, because even a lot of decisions can be made asynchronously. So it was, you know, occasionally you need ideation, you need other things from other people, you need input on the decision-making process. But at the end of the day, it was that glue and the relationship and the connectivity that we came up with. The glue, relationships, connectivity, that's why, why that's the value. And Aaron in New, New Jersey. Yeah, hi, um, <clears throat> great, great question. I like how you put the liberating structure in there too. That was fun. Um, the, I think it, 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 it always depends on the, on the organizational, uh, design and the complexity of that organization. If it's very matrixed, a lot of friction. Uh, when you have, when you're very matrixed, you have a lot of information asymmetry between people. So you have to often conquer that information gap, which then creates more friction. And then that drives a lot of the meeting cycles that I've found over time is a lot of it is just that information asymmetry between people. And they're sort of learning what that other person's vantage point is to try to understand why they have the position that they have on a particular topic. Mm. Yes. Uh, th thank you. Uh, there's so much to play with there. And uh, just to, to pick up on, on the point that Aaron made about liberating structures, a lot of you will be familiar with liberating structures. Um, some of you will also be members of the London Liberating Structures Group or one of the other Liberating Structures practice groups that are out there. Um, if you're not, look them up because Liberating Structures are a system of highly participative meeting formats, meeting designs, to go back to my uh, first of my simple move. Designing using prepared um, designs like liberating structures that people have found to work over many, many years is a quick and easy formula for success. So um, I strongly recommend liberating structures. But what about that uh, one, two, four, all process that you just went through? Who hasn't experienced it before? Who has a comment about it? What about somebody who has experienced it before? How is that for you? Sharon, go ahead. 
Okay, yeah. Um, no, we, we, we use it regularly at work. I, I just think when, when I came across the breaking structures about, I don't know, 18 months ago, it became infectious. You know, like they've got the whole catalogue of them. And one, two, four, all is great for um, breaking down the barriers of, of I, I got a team of like, you know, 40 and uh, sort of over time, but initially back in the beginning when we were forming, you know, to, to kind of, when it was kind of novel, to give them thinking time to then share in the pair and go up and up. And actually the, 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 the noise in the room was really energizing. Um, and it was just a nice, simple way to get to an energetic conversation um, without applying pressure to individuals in the room because collectively you kind of got there and their point was got across, you know, because some people don't want to talk, do they? So mm. if they feel great about somebody else talking on their behalf. But... Yeah, nice. Has anyone tried doing one, two, four, all in a platform called Spatial Chat? No, it's a spatial chat. You can actually hear the buzz. Um, have a play with it if you if you get a, get a, get an opportunity. Um, you can actually hear the buzz build, which is exactly what Sharon was saying. Um, it's one of the things that I've certainly missed from in the room facilitation. Actually, being able to hear what's going on in the breakouts. Um, spatial chat allows you to do that. So have have a bit of a play if you get the opportunity. Is it okay if we move on to the next chunk? Okay, um, so putting my slides back. Um, yeah, so we were on uh, jump ahead by taking the easy route to fun, lively and attractive online gatherings. Well, we've already talked about one of those easy routes, which is to use pre-prepared formulas like liberating structures and like the kind of structures that we've used today. So some of you know that uh, I published a book just before the, an ebook just before the lockdown called Web Events That Connect, which suggested one simple recipe for online events that just work, which basically went, you don't talk for more than seven minutes, then you do a breakout group activity, then you do some kind of quick and fast, quick and engaging debrief, then you move on. Um, it works. So you can use these pre Bad formulas and that makes a powerful difference and that relates to our design piece once you start using these kind of designs though you need to add some support it's easy at one level to just get someone to talk for 45 minutes and then say has anybody got any questions you don't need much in the way of written briefing documentation that kind of thing as soon as you make it more engaging, you want to include in your planning things like checklists. Some of you will have seen um, reports of, read reports of, what happened when surgeons and pilots started using checklists. These are, you know, highly academic professions. People had to do years of qualification. The surgeons were offended by the notion of having to do a checklist before every operation. They stopped sawing the wrong leg off um, and it makes a big difference. So we strongly recommend using checklists and also using detailed plans so that you and the rest of the organizing team can see what's going to happen at each point and who is going to do which thing and who is going to be using which tool. So in a moment, we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter. Um, if I thought about it in advance, I could have primed Cory to share the links to it. I might still do that. But um, you, know, you can use a detailed written plan to help people to support you in running the event. It's really high value actually, when you're working with your teams, just giving people a job will help people to stay engaged. So I strongly recommend all of that. And when when you use written checklists, when you will astrophies, that's one of the things that make people think that um, online meetings are high risk is that actually when things go wrong, they can go viral. Um, some of you will be familiar with this character. Does anyone know who this is? No, this, this is a cat 
who was not a cat. A lawyer was giving it giving evidence or, or, or doing a submission in an online trial in America and look it up um he's there shouting judge honestly i'm not a cat your honor i'm not a cat <laughs> but he appeared to be a cat um the funniest cartoon about that of course meant was the one which uh, showed all the cats struggling to put the human filter back on never mind you had to be there perhaps um but there are lots of catastrophes there are lots of potential pitfalls but they're actually quite easy to avoid. As I said earlier, online has got fewer risks than in the room. There are actually a lot fewer things that can go wrong in this space. Obviously things do go wrong. I understand that I'm occasionally freezing because my internet's a bit patchy, but we can overcome those things because it's worth it. <laughs> I'm going to suggest we move into the next breakout room activity. Let me... Um, tell you what we're going to do and uh, here's how it's going to be. I'm going to pop you once again into breakout rooms, no complicated um, sharing of groups this time, just straightforwardly in twos and threes. Um, but the question is, what are some of the questions that you have about what I've talked about so far today? Um, when you come back, we'll use this tool Mentimeter, which a lot of you will have used before, to gather up the questions so that we can have a systematic approach to getting them answered. But first, spend a couple of minutes um, talking about the questions that you have. I do this because it will increase the quality of the questions. It absolutely seems to work every time that when people have an opportunity to share their ideas about questions before you call for questions, not only do you avoid the tumbleweed moment, you get better quality questions. So you've just got um, two minutes. Oh, let's, let's be nice to you. You've got three minutes plus the countdown timer to chat about your questions. We'll gather them up when you come back. Open the rooms now. comes everybody. There we go. Most people are back in the room. Is everybody back? Yep. So yep. Corrie is going to share now in the chat a link to a Mentimeter page where you can input your uh, questions about all of this. If you've got a separate device, a phone or something, you can just go on your smartphone to menti.com and put in the code which is in the chat, 2183906. Or if you do, prefer to do it on your computer, you just click the link. It will take you to a page which um, is currently displayed behind me and it says no questions from the audience. Um, any moment now, some questions will, fingers crossed, appear. Lots of nice questions emerging now. And you may have also discovered that you can upvote other people's questions. So if you see a question there that looks interesting, um, by all means, upvote it, because we will use the upvoting to decide who, which questions get asked first once we go to questions, which will be very shortly. Some lovely questions here. I'm looking forward to answering these. Some questions are still being added and people are still upvoting questions. So another few seconds. Please have a look down. If you're interesting, and we'll use the upvotes to uh, decide which order we do the questions in. Okay. In a moment, we'll start answering those questions. But before we do, I want to mention something, which is, the, this is the sales bit. 
Um, some of you may have noticed in the um, promotional words for this event, I mentioned that I was launching an online course called Engaging Online Events, the Complete Step-by-Step -Step Guide. This is the place, if you're thinking, well, where do we get all these checklists? Where do we get all these designs? How do we do all this practical stuff? Um, the details are all packed into this course. Um, I've just shared in the chat the link to where you can see the details of the course and also a code, AWA. Um, so uh, I hope that that will make it feel like an unbeatable offer. You've got seven days to use that code. And when you join that course, not only do you have um, loads and loads of short videos of myself, members of the team, telling, you, telling stories about how we've used some of these approaches, the specific pitfalls, how we've avoided them. You also get access to a complete library of our templates, um, our checklists, our structures, our plans. And you get to join an online community. It's actually in, in Mighty Networks, if some of you have seen that tool before, where you can get your questions answered. You can get direct feedback on your event plans and give feedback on other people's. It's a place where we can all learn together. So if you're interested, the link is in the chat and the code is AWA50. Wait, Judy, you just cut out slightly when you was uh, talking about the introduction of, of this. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if people were experiencing that too. So uh, mm -hmm. could you just repeat, uh, um, I guess, the code and, and when, when the course takes place for everyone? Yes. So the course is a self-paced course. It's made up of recorded videos and documents and an online community. Um, so you can start it whenever you need to and do it at your own speed. You get a cert certificate at the end, um, assuming you do the, the three short um, things, tasks that you have to do to get your certificate. Um, it exists for as long as it needs to. There's a monthly Q&A cl clinic where people can come and catch up with me and talk about the challenges they've experienced and share ideas with each other. But basically, it's all our years of experience of running online gatherings squeezed into one self-paced online course. And the code for a 50% discount is AWA50. If that link is producing an error, that's a bit worrying. Um, <laughs> it shouldn't. Uh, just after I click the enroll button, I'm, I'm getting an error. Yeah. It says the page isn't found. 404 error. That's weird. I'm, I'm, I can access it. I don't know. Is it, a, it might, I don't know if it's a browser issue. I'm using Google Chrome and it's not working. Loading up. Before it was not working. Now it's working. It's working now. Excellent. Let's not panic. We don't want a tech catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So fingers crossed it's working. Let's hope it all goes okay. So let's then dive into our questions. Now for that to happen, I need to be able to see the question board on my screen. So second while I sort out my all my various um, screens. You know, you know that day when, when you can't find anything on your screen, it's always when you're talking to a group. Okay, so the, the top upvoted question is tips from others to make meetings fun. So please, um, who's got a tip to make meetings fun? Please raise your hand, either your physical hand and wave, or click the raise hand button and share your tips for how to make meetings fun. Ben, go ahead. Make sure your agenda has time out from the meeting in itself for so like five minutes or so. And we, we ask silly questions like, what is the color you're feeling today? Describe a word, what you're feeling. Uh, where would you be right now if you weren't in lockdown? That kind of stuff. Um, it's a little bit of fun. It's not wholly, wholly fun, but it, it makes a difference to kind of regular meetings. Excellent stuff. Thank you. And who was next up? It was Carlo. Yes, one thing that I tried, especially for big meetings, uh, using a Ignite Talk or Pikachu style, um, 
yeah, especially for people inexperienced, it's really fun and being time boxed is also very effective, efficient. It's just good fun. Excellent, thank you. And Sue? Um, I've got this brilliant book called um, Daniel Mesick, The Culture Game. And he talks about gaming your meetings. And so if you treat meetings like a game and you follow all the rules of a game, actually people enjoy them. So some, some way of seeing their progress as you would in a game, uh, voluntary attendance, all of those things. It's, it's called Gaming Your Meetings. It's very interesting and it's in that Culture Game book. Thank you very much, Sue. Nice idea. Um, now, there is a tech catastrophe going on in the chat um, and uh, I need to just mention what's happened. On the landing page for that course, there are two enroll buttons. The one at the bottom of the page will... As soon as we leave this meeting, I will fix the one at the top. But for the moment, scroll down, lower down the page. There's an enrolled button at the bottom, toward, well, lower down the page. It's just the one at the top, towards the top of the page that isn't working. Fingers crossed that's right. <laughs> oh, yep, that one works, yep. Robert, what, what, what fun idea do you have? I just wanted to confirm that the button works now. Thank you. And um, was there anyone else who had um, tips to make meetings fun? I couldn't understand what Carlo said very clearly. Carlo, could you put what you said into the chat box? Was yes, it? yes, yes. I'm going to. Yeah. Anyone else making meeting fun? Uh, as Aisling. Um, yeah, so some of the things that I've tried with teams before is just, you know, like the blob tree is a nice opener or emojis for younger people <laughs> if they want those. Not that they're young anymore, apparently. Um, but we've also done um, some uh, creativity exercises where people have to, so it's taken from Paul Goddard's um, work just on, you know, enlightening sprint planning sessions. So there's like some activities to engage creativity like mm -hmm. seven ways to use a paper clip or seven ways they, um, you know, make a pig fly. So they were, they were really fun things to do um, and gets people in the right frame of mind as well. Nice. Um, Aislinn, the first thing you said, was it blob tree? Didn't blob tree, yeah. If you type it into Google, you'll see it. It's like a tree full of blobs. <laughs> <laughs> All the blobs are at different points on the tree and some are hanging on for dear life and some are just lunging about and enjoying life. So you ask people which one they're feeling like today. Oh, I, it, I remember the picture. I didn't know it was called the blob tree. Nice. Thank I call it blob tree. It might not be called that. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's got these characters on a tree and you choose which one fits yep. your feeling. Nice. Thank you. And Bianca? Yeah. Uh, you already mentioned it, but I just want to mention it again. Spatial chat, just use something different for your meetings. It will just recreate the scene of a pub or whatever you want. So you can play around with it. I'll leave the link in the chat as well. Yeah, I also wanted to mention maybe some point. To show how you're feeling. Idea. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I wanted to add uh, something. So uh, what we also do uh, to make it more engaging, I think in every meeting when we meet also with a group more on a regular basis, maybe in a continuation of workshop and so forth, we always try to get to know us better. So we'll put up like a map and say, okay, please put up a picture from where you live, uh, your, your, your preferred place uh, around the corner. Or next time we talk about, okay, what is your preferred place for vacation? And, and they could also put up a picture and tell a story around it. So just to make it more engaging and that we also create a better relation to each other. Nice. One thing that I like to try is, because it also gets people to stand up and move, is send people to their kitchen to get an implement to, to, to represent them or, or, or to tell a story about or something like that. Anything to get people to physically stand up and move, to get air into their system, is going to increase engagement, increase the quality of your conversation. I can confirm that such energizers uh, work pretty well in my company. Um, go to your fridge and grab the weirdest thing which is currently in and bring it and show it to the other ones. It's so fun. Just in, the, in between a meeting, which is of course not longer than 45 minutes. 
Of course, um, I'm breaking my own rules tonight, and uh, and we've done a 90 minute meeting without a without a stretch break. But uh, hopefully, you'll forgive me. Um, let's move on to the next question: How to challenge a meeting that may be not needed? I think that this is really interesting. When we got talking about, well, maybe not all meetings are needed. I think the first way that certainly my students have found is to challenge whether your attendance is needed. Practice with that first before challenging whether, whether the meeting needs to exist at all. So when somebody invites you to a meeting and you think, hang on a moment, reply and say, what value will I bring to this meeting? They shouldn't, you know, some people invite everybody to every meeting because they fear that people will be upset if they're not invited. So ask, why have I been invited? Once asking, why have I been invited? Who am I going to add for your meeting? Then it starts to become fairly routine to, to, to be curious. What value does this mean? challenge necessarily to be effective you can be asking questions can i just clarify use softening language can i clarify what specifically is going to be achieved in this meeting i'm curious have we got exactly the right people i'm curious can we be more precise about the purpose of the meeting so that we maximize value so that we make sure it's interesting so that we make sure people stay engaged and aren't bored. Most want meetings to be of value, they don't want to be. Bored. You can pretty much get people to agree if it's clear that your intentions are honorable, you're not trying to do anybody down, you're just trying to get the job done. Does that answer the question? Is there anyone who wants to add anything about how to challenge a meeting that may be not needed? I, I have a question. How do, you, how do you do it when it's a, a very senior member? Because they, I guess they are generally the ones at times to be the most guilty. And I'm not saying this is my company. I'm not saying this is AWA because luckily we don't have many meetings. So I'm, I'm happy, but I've been in previous companies where it has been meeting after meeting and you're sitting there wondering, I have nothing to contribute to this and I could be getting on with something else completely different. So yeah, what, what would, what's- Same thing, I would say. The senior people in the organization have got their eye on the bottom line. They do not want to waste money. And that means they don't want to waste time. If, you're, if it's not clear to you why you have been invited to the meeting, you should ask because that's important feedback to the senior person. That either they have not been clear about why you've been invited, or maybe they've misunderstood what your role is, because the more senior they are, the more disconnected they are from, the, from exactly who's doing which role. So don't leave them in the dark, give them the gift of feedback. The chances of somebody, of the boss being grievously offended by you asking, why have you invited me to a meeting, is zero. I'm going to mark that one answered and move on. Um, especially in a bigger meeting, how to tell if quiet people are engaged or not. I think that's a really interesting question, especially when people don't have their cameras on. Way back when, before video conferencing was a thing, one of my friends applied for a job at Mind Gym. Do you remember, some of you will know Mind Gym, they do sort of short lunchtime trainings. And they used to do them using audio only online calls. And the, the rules for their training Uh, what do you reckon? How frequently should you force an interaction from your group if you can't see them? You may have to repeat that for us, Judy. You yeah. Yeah, sorry, you, you did. You went off. Yeah, off you off went off. 
Oh, all right, so <laughs> sorry. You type oh, Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you've got a training group and you can't see them, how frequently do you think you should force them to interact with you? By force, I mean invite them to participate in a poll or write in the chat. Best practice is every 90 seconds. Now, that's going to be really hard in a big meeting to do that. So, things that I strongly recommend, get people to turn on their camera. Apart from anything else, that will really help them to stay engaged. If you've got your own camera, and it means everybody can see with a general sense of who's involved and who's not. The worst kind of formula is this huge meeting, 1700 people, and I'm going to talk to you for 45 minutes. You can work on the assumption that nobody's listening. Because the chances are that even with the best intentions, people just can't focus for that length of time. Um, so what I, what I do recommend is if you've got to do a, a talk where you can't see the group and um, you 